Thank you very much, Lisa, for the uh, introduction and also the warm welcome here to Dublin. It's been a while since I've been in the country, probably since about 2004, 2005, when there was a Eurocall conference in Limerick that I did have the chance to come also and spend a few days in Dublin afterwards. And because it was at the end of summer, the, the weather was slightly better. But having lived in Wellington for the past nine and a half years, I do know this weather very well and um, not too uncomfortable with the dreary and dark and slightly foggy and rainy season because we there's certainly see plenty of that, even though we are now entering summer. So I'm kind of switching seasons at the moment, um, but I'm really happy to be here today and also spend time with you. And I'm really looking forward to the afternoon session. And then if there are any DCU people around, we can also spend some time tomorrow and Lisa will have the details on that. Um, to kick things off, my portfolio journey um, started all the way in Munich in Germany at the Ludwig Maximilians Universität. And um, there I was involved in a multi-year EU funded project, Sprachchancen, where we looked at increasing the employability chances of students by um, making it possible for them to have better language learning skills. And so the project <coughs> I was involved in, immediate teaching, did not work directly with students, but rather looked at the lecturer <coughs> side of things. Because if students need to have better skills, they also need to get uh, better teaching. And if nobody kind of helps the teachers and teaching staff along how to do blended learning, how to implement it, how to work with digital technologies, how are they so supposed to do that without that support? And so the project um, that we looked at was re very much geared towards uh, students in support positions in a language lab and also language, foreign language teachers to give them the skills and competencies on hand to work with digital media and um, use them to their benefits in their teaching. After Munich, I went to the University of Luxembourg where I worked in a Bachelor in Educational Sciences where there was also quite a large e-portfolio implementation but not a single technology chosen. At the time, it was very much as a network drive or students could create their portfolios um, on paper. And um, at one point, the director of the program said, well, let's find a different tool, one that makes it easier for people to work with, to engage with, and not having to download all the files to a personal computer all the time when wanting to give feedback to students. And that is when um, I got to know Mahara. And it was in 2008, so very early on in the history of the software, just about two years after the project had launched. And then in June 2010, I decided to move to New Zealand and actually work with the Mahara team in Catalyst, um, who is the maintainer and also main development company of the software. And I've been since there since. So if you do want to know a little bit about New Zealand, I can definitely share some pictures afterwards. Um, but for the time being, I'd very much like to focus on the ePortfolio stories and tell you a little bit about that. So what do I do on a daily basis? Well, I don't just have one role, I have multiple roles. And so here I just want to very briefly share the six main roles that I kind of have in the community. There are a few others also in regards to project management and working with clients because I have lots of different heads throughout the day. But the main ones in the open source community are project lead. As Lisa already mentioned, um, I'm kind of responsible for a lot of things that go into Mahara, how they go into Mahara, working with the development team. And that leads nicely into also being the community manager, kind of attending events like this, trying to connect people also from afar, from my couch where I usually present at home, and making, uh, yeah, making connections between organizations that people can start projects together or know who they can contact, who has done a similar ePortfolio implementation or who works in a similar department and see what they have been doing. 
But oftentimes, I'm also the agony aunt. Um, if there are problems in the software, if people have questions, they do come to us, and then we support them as best as possible in the community where free support is offered um, in the forums, and oftentimes, we also look at social media and answering questions there. And um, again, also kind of participating in the project itself, being a ninja in Mahara, um, fixing bugs in terms of very easy ones, because I'm certainly not a developer. Um, we have very talented people for that in the team, but kind of fixing certain language strings. So if there's a mistake in a sentence or if a help file does not make sense, those are the things that I can fix where I don't really need a lot of technical know-how and can contribute back to the community also on the code side of things. And it's really fantastic also working with organizations like DCU and developing new features, implementing those, seeing them put into Mahara or changing existing features. And so everybody of you here that works with Mahara is a part of the community and is also an active contributor because even just by using the software and giving feedback, you are participating and help us make the software better. Um, I'm also the author of the Mahara Manual. If you find any mistakes there, please do let me know. If you want to contribute to the manual and write um, your, your own stories and um, make things better there, then please also let me know. It's an effort that has been going on since 2011, since Mahara 1.4. That's when we launched the new manual. And since then, I've been keeping it up for every single release um, pretty much every half year now in order to make sure that all the new features and changes are documented. And last but not least, I'm also facilitator of events, presentations, and uh, training sessions on Mahara and portfolios in general, trying to kind of bring them across to people and um, help them along their portfolio journey. And today, I'd like to take you all on a journey um, of exploration in which we are encountering the portfolio in a number of different forms and as its main actor and look at how it has evolved and where it might go today. And to do so, I'd like to tell you a little bit of a story of Waitemata District Health Board in New Zealand. So Waitemata District Health Board is located in the Auckland region, pretty much just all the way to the north of Auckland. It's quite a large area for New Zealand and um, it serves about 630,000 people. That may not sound much in European context, but if you kind of look at the population of New Zealand at just about 4.9 million, that does account for 13% of the population just in that um, area over there. And so it is the largest district health board in New Zealand population wise. And so they have lots and lots of nurses, support staff, and other professionals. And um, in the 1980s, uh, Jocelyn Peach, who was the director of nursing at Waitemata, looked at how she can uh, recognize professional competence in nurses. And um, she used Patricia Benner's framework, um, looking at the progression of a student nurse to an expert nurse. And those were early work and early considerations, um, which then culminated in the 1990s when uh, clinical career pathways were introduced. And then in 2004, when the Nursing Council of New Zealand decided that portfolios are the way forward to certify nurses. And for, let's go up 14 years later is when Waitemata looked into digital portfolios. But for these 14 years, and Waitemata DHB was definitely one of the um, early adopters of competency portfolios and really also recognizing the learning that nurses had done. There was the portfolio cupboard in the office. Many of you who have been working with paper-based portfolios might know something similar, um, where you had to get a key, portfolios were locked away, only one particular person or another person had access to it, um, and it was actually quite painful because if we look at that um, area that Waitemata uh, DHB covers, there was not just one hospital, there were at least three hospitals. Then there were rural um, or nurses that worked in rural areas. 
So portfolios had to be carted all over the place by an admin um, driving around to Auckland, distributing portfolios, picking them up from the nurses, giving them to the managers, to the EP assessors, to the PDRP assessors, and then bringing them back in and uh, making sure that all of that is tracked. And it was not really easy lifting because the majority of these portfolios were quite heavy because they were all binders and they contained the evidence of three years of practice. So there was a lot of logistics involved in just making sure that the program ran and that the portfolios got where they needed to be on time. And that was when the DHB kind of decided, well, we do need to look at a different solution because the population is growing. So more and more nurses get involved in the process. Um, the um, amount of work does not decrease. And um, so in 2017, 2018, um, the investigation into portfolios kind of went into the hot phase and um, the DHB decided to go with Mahara and um, had some extra features developed for the software because out of the box, it did not quite meet the requirements um, because of course, every organization has its own workflow. And in order to support the workflow better, we implemented a number of features that the DHB also contributed back to the community and everybody using Mahara can um, take advantage of these, these days. And so in, December, uh, in September last year, so September 2018, um, the first pilot group of about 90 nurses started using the platform Kopaki Tiaki Hora Healthcare Portfolio. The DHB welcomed the idea to set up a multi-tenanted Mahara site so that it was also accessible to other organizations and not just to the DHB itself, making it possible for people to collaborate on new features, um, to share the, the cost of the maintenance, and also to engage with each other. Because we know that portfolios oftentimes do benefit greatly from the share um, aspect of sharing and talking it through with others. And also having the possibility of setting up a community of practice amongst the nurses, the nurse educators, and also the learning and development teams that implement these portfolio solutions. And what the DHB does is create a very heavily templated portfolio because it is for a, uh, it follows a competency standard. So all nurses need to create their portfolio in a very specific way. And the template helps them to do that so that they don't have to think much about the structure. They don't have to worry what needs to go into my portfolio, read the documentation, then create all those pages. No, they get their pages set. They know we have to fill in these 13 or 14 pages depending on um, what level of registered nurse um, they are going for. And they know the domains are in there, the domain descriptions are directly in the template and um, they can fill in the self-assessment, the peer assessment is there and then also the manager feedback. And they have additional elements like the sign of and verification indicating very quickly to the nurses themselves and also to their managers where the portfolios are ready for the next step and then can be put into the learning management system for additional tracking and assessment through the assessors. And um, kind of already this very brief description kind of shows you that there are several stakeholders involved. So we have the nurse herself or himself. Um, they fill in the most part of the portfolio, but certain elements they don't even have to fill in because they come automatically from the learning management system. So we have connected it to their LMS, um, which is uh, co avatar Learn that is shared amongst a number of DHBs based on Totara. And through web services, we pull profile information from the LMS directly into the portfolio itself, making it possible for them not even to have to worry about setting up their own profile, not having to say again who their manager is who, um, and where they work in which ward and service area, but really taking advantage of um, technological um, interfaces in order to make the life of the nurses easy. Because they are there primarily to support patients, to help patients, to make patients in the hospital better, 
rather than needing to know how the technology works in all its details. And that is where the template helps very much because they just copy that, put it into their account, and the number of the information they need in their portfolio is already pre-populated. And if they switch wards during the time of the three years of certification, changes automatically in the portfolio as well. They don't even have to do a thing. Besides the nurse, we have the peer assessors. Um, in the case of Oyatim Mata, the peer assessment is actually a blind assessment. So the peers do not see what the nurse has written. This is very unusual for a lot of other um, peer feedback um, areas that we have in the portfolio. Um, but how Oyatim Mata wants to deal with it is that they do want to combat plagiarism because what they had seen in the past was often that the peers pretty much repeated what the nurse had said in her um, self-assessment, and so they do want to prevent that verbatim copying and pasting, but really get to know the opinion of the peer. And the third main actor in the portfolio process is the manager, who looks at the portfolio um, once the nurse and the peer have given their own assessments, and then gives an overall comment um, on the portfolio and um, signs of a domain, meaning um, a lot of standards that fall under that particular domain. Then it, the portfolio goes into the learning management system where the PDRP admin, and PDRP stands for Professional Development and Recognition Program, so just the overall program of, um, in which the nurses are involved for their certification. So the PDRP admin in the LMS then assigns it to an assessor, and then the assessor looks at that portfolio and makes their final assessment, and then everything is done and the nurse can start on her new three yearly cycle. And so the portfolio is not just with one person, but with multiple people that are involved and at various stages who have a pretty important stake in the portfolio and the portfolio would not be the portfolio it is without any of the other people involved, in particular, particular the peer assessor and the manager. So they are crucial parts of the portfolio creation process. Now let's stop very briefly at this part of the story for Wyatimata and kind of take a step back and look at the history of portfolios because Wyatimata started about in the 1980s thinking about something that might in the future become a portfolio, recognizing competencies and skills of nurses. And so how does it relate to the overall history of e-portfolios? Well, kind of everything of course goes back to the Greeks, but we are not really starting there today. Um, today I'd like to start with 1813, because that is the year when the term portfolio first came up in the Oxford um, English Dictionary. So since then, we have a definition of portfolios, and it is very much kind of that folder that we know of, um, designers um, and architects that they carry on and show off their work. And then kind of the term was there, and the more modern history of portfolio use then starts in the early 1900s, when, uh, when people started looking at the history of student progress and documenting that. So there was um, apparently not so much yet that reflective element in there, but more kind of collecting all the evidence of the learning so that when somebody applied for a job later on or went for a different position, they, um, the employer could look at all of that evidence and make up their mind. That goes on then until about um, shortly after the Second World War, when more and more people joined the workforce, in particular also women who had worked during the war, gained skills and competencies, but did not have a formal education to support that they could now continue in the job rather than giving it to a soldier who had come home. And so the recognition of prior learning, in particular the informal learning, so outside of the classroom, on the job, um, <coughs> became more important. And then, in, as many of you probably already know, in the 1970s, kind of teaching portfolios came um, in, into light and were started with turning more and more into student portfolios in the 1980s. And um, then also kind of taking a larger step forward, the electronic portfolio started in the 2000s. 
um, once we had the World Wide Web, because now suddenly we had more opportunities available to um, document learning, not just on paper as had been done throughout the rest of the history of portfolios, but really also looking at um, digital media and working with lots of different types of artifacts. And so why does not everyone have a portfolio these days? Even though we have this history kind of going back, not just up to the 1800s, but also back to the Greeks. And we all know that reflecting is very important and that it does help in our learning. Why is it still so difficult to go from pockets of use of portfolios in an organization to at scale implementations? What is holding us back? Well, I think one aspect is that the portfolio is not so easily easy to grasp because it's a multi-layered story. There are many different components and everybody also has their own interpretation and um, has their own viewpoint of it. And first of all, not everybody agrees on what a portfolio is. In particular now also the e-portfolio. Is it a technology? Is it a pedagogical approach? Is it a process or is it a product? Um, well, it can be all of the above. Students these days don't necessarily just have one portfolio. They might have a portfolio they need to create for assessment purposes, looking at our nurses for the recertification. But at the same time, they might repurpose some artifacts, some learning evidence from that assessment portfolio in a showcase portfolio to show off all the best things they have done. And yet again, for another portfolio, they might use, again, other parts of the learning evidence for employability purposes, to get an internship or to, be, to apply for a new position. So one person can already have three very different portfolios and share them with very different audiences. And though there's nobody who can say, well, this one is wrong and this one is right. And some of these portfolios might be done in an institutional e-portfolio setting, like at DCU with Loop Reflect, yet others might be created completely publicly because it's a showcase and people want to share everything with the entire world. And so we can put many different lenses towards the idea of what a portfolio is and the definition of a portfolio, and um, also get many different perspectives and different actors. So some portfolios might only be created for a person themselves that they don't share with anybody if they just really want to note down their reflections and their learning and use that <coughs> as kind of diary. Um, whereas others are shared with a small group of people, maybe also just only with a mentor, with a classroom teacher, and yet others are entirely public. So we also have many different people involved. For Wyatt Mata, we had the nurse, the peer, the manager, and the assessor, and then also the admin who kind of took all care of all the logistics. In a university <coughs> setting, we oftentimes at least have the student and the teacher or the lecturer. And um, they both look at the portfolio in different ways. For the students, it's their own learning. Um, they want to further themselves. They want to collaborate for the teachers also giving a grade and making sure that the students complete a particular course in a study program. So lots and lots of different areas and depending on where you stand in the landscape, you have a different view of things. Everything just changes around. Yet it is still the same landscape, but we look at it very differently. And I think that is one of the difficulties to also at an institution to bring across what is this portfolio when everybody sees it very differently. One department needs an assessment portfolio, the other department just needs a work integrated learning portfolio, and yet career services really just want to have the showcase portfolio. So what is it? What do we do? The concept of a portfolio, I think, is not as easily grasped as the concept of a learning management system, where we know we need it for a course, we need to have the syllabus in there, we need to take attendance, we have grade, the grade book in there, and then people, yes, can still have their different activities and assignments, 
but the main structure is pretty much the same. Whereas for the portfolios, everything can be different depending on where you go at a university or at any other organization. And so just also looking, when we look at the pedagogical approach for portfolios, there are a number of other follow-up questions like, is it a progress and a development portfolio? Is it an assessment portfolio? Is it a showcase portfolio or portfolio for the employability? And then these basic types can yet again be fizzled out into further subtypes depending on who you're reading in the literature um, and what your own approach is. And then also depending on the context, yeah, people can have multiple portfolios. And portfolios oftentimes do not stand on their own. They can be integrated because they are also created for specific purposes and therefore become a part of a bigger learning journey. Mahara started out not as assessment portfolio, but really as more of a personal learning environment because the tertiary institutions that started the project and thought of a grant in 2005 to actually get funding to start the project kind of thought that, well, the learning management system is available, and, but it is very teacher-centered. The teachers decide what students can do. They decide when they can discuss things in a forum, when they can upload something for an assignment, and when grading takes place but there was usually not really a space where the students could just do their own thing and bring in their experiences from outside of the classroom. And that's where the personal learning environment comes in because the students have control over that. The students decide what they want to keep from their learning management system, from their classroom activities, and what they want to showcase from their life outside of it. And that, I think, is where the power is for the portfolios. And yes, while we do have assessment portfolios, they have their justification like every other type of portfolios. It still means that students can bring in their own thinking and uh, their own evidence from outside of the classroom. And it is up to us who implement the portfolios to give the students that freedom, to make it possible for them and to make them aware of the possibilities that even when it is an assessment portfolio, it does not necessarily mean all the things only that they've done at uni, but that they can also talk about an internship or a job they have on the site or volunteer experience because those experiences are part of the student's life. They make the student a whole person. And um, that is where I think it is yeah, very difficult at times to grasp what the portfolio is and who is involved and what can be done with it because it is so elusive and it really depends on who you're talking to. You have a lot of people here in the room that have been working with portfolios for a number of years that I'm sure have certain elements the same and very much the same thinking, but then look at portfolios very differently and define it in a particular context. And then also, um, how they are working with it. And so if you just very briefly look at learning, ideally learning is lifelong um, because we kind of have the life before school, then the life after school, our work life, and then we also have the retirement at some point. But just looking at learning in the lifelong dimension is oftentimes not enough. And the portfolio really helps us also to bring in the life-wide dim dimension. Um, in making, the non -for uh, making learning that is not formal visible. And so, of course, the non-formal learning kind of stretches throughout our life. That is any learning that happens while we are talking with people. And it really starts early. It doesn't just start when we enter school, but kids learn from when they are born. And so all of that is more or less non-formal learning because it does not happen in a classroom. Then of course, the formal learning aspect, especially during school time um, or university or any tertiary education um, that people attend. But formal learning can also come in during the life of work 
um, when you're upskilled or when people are retraining to take on a new job, that's when they might go for an additional certification or diploma. So we have the formal learning, but it's kind of getting smaller the older we get. And the informal learning takes on over. And informal learning in this regard is learning that happens in the workplace, but not in a formal learning setting. So that can just be a conversation with a colleague, that can be a one-on-one -on -one meetings, um, very brief input sessions, and also increasingly tutorials that we are watching online and just learning for ourselves rather than being in a more formal classroom setting, which ends with a certification. <coughs> and um, those, all these different types of learning can play an important part in a portfolio and can be replicated there and can be reproduced and evidenced there. And that is where the portfolio differs very much from um, other aspects because it allows us to incorporate all of that in um, our portfolios. So kind of looking at a definition of modern portfolio thinking, um, I'd like to go with the one from Helen Chen, which was really nicely summarized by Vicky Suter on folio thinking, which is a process of engaging in the collection, organization, reflection, connection, that leads to a person's ability to speak intelligently and concisely about one's learning experiences, what they mean and their value, and how the experiences relate one to another. And you have the storytelling in there. So we are always telling our learning story. I kind of summarized though, this entire um, definition in five works. And you do get the slides so you can um, look them up later again. And for me, all these five verbs, for the ease of use, at least in English, doesn't quite work so well in German or many other languages, but in English we can kind of say it's the five C's. Because what the definition I find from um, folio thinking excludes, it's kind of the creation of the learning evidence. It starts with the collection and the reflection of it. So for me, actually, the portfolio process starts with the creation. So create evidence, collect it, and organize it, curate it, and that then includes the reflection because we do want to make sense of the evidence we have, and we are not always showing all the evidence in the portfolio that we've collected, but we need to be judicious and select what we actually want to show. Then converse with others about it, share our learning, get feedback from them, and then also connect with them. Connect in groups, um, look at their portfolios, and learn from them as well. And now if we are looking back at Vajatamata DHB of how their portfolio journey continues, after having gone through all of that, um, the creation of the evidence, the collection, the self-reflection, and then also getting feedback from other people, is that we kind of contrast what have they done in the paper-based approach and what are they doing now? Because if you remember, portfolios have not been new there, but they were instituted by the Nursing Council in 2004 officially. Um, but what Waitemata has already seen during the pilot that they ran last year and then continuing to work with the nurses this year was that in the past, the portfolios were an assessment because it was reported what the nurses had done. These days, it is looking more at professional development and what can the nurses do now that they've completed this part. It is very much with a future focus, looking into the future, um, looking into what they can do differently. And for minimal engagement, you might think, well, you can't really write very nicely on the paper portfolios. Um, they actually have conversations these days. And these conversations don't just happen online because what is really encouraged is also to have conversations before the official written feedback is given so that the peers talk with the nurses, the manager talks with the nurse first in order to give them their opinion and then what's in the portfolio is just more or less sometimes a summary. And that really helps with that social learning aspect, the talking things through, um, brainstorming on what can be done differently. And 
people don't procrastinate on their portfolios anymore, but they want to start early. Um, we'll have to see in the next few years if that continues to be the case or whether it's just the shiny new tool and the shiny new thing. But at the moment, nurses want to start their portfolios when they are just starting out with their next certification cycle. So not having the portfolios until 2022 to be done or also next year or the year after. Um, because they just find it so much easier. They've heard good feedback from the pilot group that it's faster to create the portfolio, faster to work with. And that is a huge <coughs> advantage in, in a big organization um, that otherwise always kind of is after people because it also helps the administrator. And by making it um, possible for people to create their portfolio online, they can just very quickly go through that mandatory process. And kind of one nurse, I find, sums it up really nicely in saying that the appraisal was fuller and showed a better level of constructive interaction and purposeful review. And that after they had done it on paper before. So we really see that changing the medium can help. And um, the learning and development team at Viatimata worked very closely with the PDRP coordinator in making sure that they do not just copy what's on paper to the electronic world, but also looking at how they can change certain processes to make it easier and make it more relevant. And so Waitemata is a good example um, to explore portfolio practices because it has had a long-standing practice and use of it, um, but it was reshaped. Um, they went electronically very thoughtfully thinking about why they are doing that and how they can help nurses with it. And it is also fully integrated into the hospital practices. It's not this add-on that everybody forgets about. No, it's part of the whole thing. And they started small with a pilot and then grew from there. Over the last um, nine, nine to 10 months, they've trained over a thousand nurses in working with the portfolios trained the managers, managers want to implement it from next year on. There are no paper-based portfolios anymore. Everything will be done electronically. And that is a huge chip. That's a lot of change management. That was facilitated by the learning and development team because they also had the mandate from their organization and the nursing director said, yes, I want to do that. I give you time to implement it and I want to go ahead with it. And they also use a platform that, other, that the nursing students already use. So when students come from university, they are familiar with the platform already. They can cop, um, import their portfolio and be off and running. And um, yeah, that's the story of Waitemata with a bit of gen general um, history and ways of using portfolios into Spears. And so I'd like to leave you with a few resources that might help you kind of look at portfolios in a new or different way if you haven't already done so, um, because there's lots and lots of work out there. This can only be a very brief um, selection, but I find these ones are in particular very good reading because oftentimes also quite short reading and some of them you might already know. Um, the first one is the Field Guide to ePortfolio published by Abel. It is very short executive summary style reading um, that you might also want to put in front of your manager and show them why portfolios are a good thing and um, look at very different aspects of a portfolio implementation. Then we have the learning portfolio in higher education, a game of snakes and ladders that in particular the Irish crowd here at uh, DCU will know because it originated here, which is a very good literature overview summary and then also outlook on learning portfolios. The next one is the high impact e-portfolio practice. Um, in the United States, e-portfolios became a high impact practice, the 11th high impact practice in 2016. And therefore we have seen uptake of e-portfolios um, since then in various different forms. And last but not least, not, let's not forget the assessment aspect of it. A very nicely curated and edited book by Lisa on ePortfolio based assessment with um, case studies from around the country and also um, across the ditch in the UK. Yeah, and some of you might have even contributed to that. And um, the learning and 
working though does not really stop there. There are two new initiatives this year, um, namely the Evil T Able Task Force Ethics in ePortfolios, because digital ethics does play an increasingly important role. So we are looking at, well, how can ePortfolios um, benefit from it? What do we need to make sure are in ePortfolios? How do we tell students about it and lecturers? How do we make people aware of it? And if you are interested in that topic, please do let me know because right now we're in the research phase and uh, definitely also want to talk with different organizations and getting their perspectives on it because right now it is very much US centric, um, but we are trying also to pull in other areas of the world in order to make it um, an initiative that is um, spanning the globe. And then I'm very much looking forward to um, today's launch of the ePortfolio Ireland survey on the Irish ePortfolio practices and also look forward to the results of that um, in order to learn more about what you're doing here in the country. So I'd like to leave you with a couple of questions. Um, over to you and we can either look at them directly now or at some point during the connect and converse sessions or later during the day. And those questions are, where do you see portfolios making their biggest contribution to a student's learning journey? And the second one, a bit more critical self-reflection, is what is the most difficult aspect for you of implementing portfolios at your organization? And see if we either have a few more minutes left right now or later to take a look at these questions. Or if you have your own, of course, you're very welcome to post them either to me or to the entire group as well. Thank you.